West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Well, if you think Donald Trump is stupid and you have every right to imagine, imagine what his lawyers think of him. New York's attorney general releases a letter that shows that Mazars, the accounting firm, has dropped Donald Trump and Donald Trump's insane ego demands that Donald Trump release a statement fighting back against that Mazars letter. And when he does that, when Donald Trump does that, he contradicts everything that his lawyers have been telling the judge in that case. And then tonight in the breaking news of the night, the attorney general of the state of New York uses Donald Trump's exact profoundly stupid words in his statement against him. That's where that case is tonight. Mazars has flipped. Mazars has flipped and is working with New York prosecutors in their investigations of Donald Trump. That is the judgment of our first guest tonight, attorney Philip Rotner, who has studied the letter the Mazars accounting firm sent to Donald Trump's company, dropping Donald Trump and the company as clients last week. Philip Rotner writes, quote, this is a big deal. It means that Mazars has flipped and is now protecting itself, not Trump, or as Trump put it in his statement last night, that Mazars didn't feel it could fight it out. That is undoubtedly the non waivable conflict of interest with the Trump organization referred to in Mazars' February 9th letter. New York's Attorney General Letitia James revealed the letter in a court filing this week to support her argument that Donald Trump and his children should be forced to comply with her subpoenas for their under oath testimony about the Trump businesses. And in the breaking news of this hour, Attorney General Letitia James has now responded to Donald Trump's statement about her release of that February 9th letter from Donald Trump's now former accountants. In a filing with the judge in the case tonight, the attorney general says it is truly rare for a party to publicly disagree with statements submitted by his own attorneys in a signed pleading, let alone one day after the pleading was filed. The attorney general refers to the fact that Donald Trump's lawyers insisted in writing to the court that Donald Trump should not be compelled to testify about his businesses because He does not know enough about his businesses. Tonight, the attorney general told the judge, quote, he professes intimate knowledge of his company, its assets and their values. And in the statement made yesterday, quotes Donald Trump in the statement made yesterday where he attacked Hillary Clinton and the attorney general. Today, the attorney general points out that Donald Trump's written rant responding to the Mazars letter begins with Donald Trump's own description of the valuation of his assets, which is exactly what the attorney general is investigating. In his written statement, Donald Trump boasts 
My company has among the best real estate and other assets anywhere in the world, has significant amounts of cash, has relatively little debt, which is totally current. He then listed specific figures for cash and marketable securities, escrow, reserve deposits and prepaid expenses, total assets, net worth, total liabilities and net worth. He went on to say that the numbers don't tell the whole story because, quote, based on current enthusiasm and transactions which have or will take place, the brand value today could be, in my opinion, substantially higher. So once again, Donald Trump holds himself out as the highest, most definitive authority on the valuation of his businesses. And he does that in his boastful written statement, which is a direct and complete total contradiction to what his lawyers have told the judge in this case, the reason his lawyers have given for why he should not have to testify. The attorney general clearly believes Donald Trump's written statement solidifies her right to compel his under oath testimony about the valuation of his businesses. In her filing with the judge tonight, Attorney General James says, quote, Mr. Trump claims to know exactly what the office of the attorney general is investigating. Once again, we see there is no one, no one who testifies against Donald Trump more effectively than Donald Trump. The New York Times has reported that Mazars has been cooperating with the criminal investigation of Donald Trump by the Manhattan District Attorney and that Trump's principal accountant at Mazars has testified to the grand jury in that investigation. The Mazars letter to Trump specified that Mazars decided last week to refuse to continue working on Trump tax returns that were due this week saying, quote, there are only a limited number of tax returns that still remain to be filed, including those of Donald J. Trump and Melania Trump. The Mazars letter pointed out that the due date for those returns was yesterday, February 15th, and added this one specific item about the returns. We believe the only information left to complete those returns is the information regarding the Matt Calamari Jr. apartment. As you know, Donald Bender has been asking for this information for several months, but has not received it. Once that information is provided to your new tax preparers, the returns can be complete. Now, remember that the Trump company and the company's chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, have already been indicted for tax fraud in Manhattan for not declaring compensation that included a rent-free apartment car payments, and school tuition for children. The Mazars letter indicates that Mazars was unwilling to file tax returns that did not properly deal with, quote, the Matt Calamari Jr. apartment, especially at a time when the Trump Organization is already under indictment for using rent-free apartments as undeclared income for people working for Trump. Donald Trump issued a completely incoherent written rant yesterday in reaction to Mazars dropping him as a client. And in it, he said that Hillary Clinton should be executed for spying. And he seemed to confess, to just confess to the fraud charges that the company is already facing by writing this. The charge against a 74-year-old long-term wonderful employee, Alan Weisselberg, is that he did not pay taxes on a company car or a company apartment. Do others pay such a tax? Did former Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance pay a tax on his car? And a charge having to do with my paying for the education of his grandchildren. Murderers all over the city, and they are worried about me helping with young children's education. So Donald Trump appears to be admitting that no taxes were paid on the compensation to Alan Weisenberg that included a free car, a free apartment, and free tuition for his grandchildren, a compensation package that was close to $2 million. Donald Trump does not say that all relevant tax laws were complied with. He simply seems to be saying, why are they enforcing tax laws against us?
The breaking news from New York's Attorney General tonight comes on top of the news earlier in the day that President Biden has once again crushed Donald Trump's claims of executive privilege to try to block the release of White House visitor logs, including the White House visitor log of January 6th, the most important day in the Trump presidency, the day a Trump mob attacked the Capitol. To claim that White House visitor logs are classified, as Donald Trump has been trying to, is virtually impossible since the Obama White House and now the Biden White House have both routinely made public their own White House visitor logs. The Biden White House counsel, Dana Remus, in a letter telling the National Archives to release the Trump White House visitor logs to the January 6th committee said, quote, as a matter of policy, and subject to limited exceptions, the Biden administration voluntarily discloses such visitor logs on a monthly basis. The Obama administration followed the same practice. The majority of entries over which the former president has asserted executive privilege would be publicly released under current policy. Accordingly, President Biden does not uphold the former president's assertions of privilege. He therefore instructs you to provide to the select committee the records and portions of records identified as privileged by the former president. It is Thursday, the 17th of February of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Well, how are you doing? Uh, the Olympics continue apace. Uh, has anyone really been paying attention? Well, some of us have. I uh, did check out the uh, free skate program. I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of, well, you know, free skate. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, it's it's been in the Olympics for quite a while, and it is a marquee event. Uh, I'm much more interested in events that don't have a judgment upon style, shall we say. You know, whoever's the fastest wins. I've always liked that. Whoever went the farthest wins. But in the Winter Olympics, a lot of those events that you go the fastest or you go the farthest, you're still being judged on style points. Anyway, uh, that being said, not being a particularly big fan of uh, ice skating, the dance and all of that, uh, I have watched it before. I'm not really into these ever younger kids competing in the Olympics. Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I think 12 year old gymnasts shouldn't be competing in the Olympics. They should, you know, be in college. I, it's just me. I just think little kids, I know, everybody says, yeah, but they're really good tumblers. Y yeah, great. But they're still little kids. And I think having that level of competition for a little kid may not necessarily be a helpful part of their development. But that's just me. So uh, this 15-year-old Russian skater who has been accused of taking performance-enhancing drugs, which I got to tell you, Russia has a long history of doing this, and it's not the athletes who came up with the idea. It's not the athletes who are seeking out these performance-enhancing drugs. They are on a regimen of them by their coaches and, by extension, the state. And they've been caught before, and the IOC has been bought off as usual. And this is what happened with this uh, court of arbitration, saying that she's too young and she's exempt. But, as it's been noted, Tara Lipinski was 15 when she won her gold medal, and, you know, she was clean. So, the court of arbitration had decided, well, we'll let her skate. But if she wins, there won't be an, a medal ceremony. You know, she got first, second, or third. No medal ceremony. Well, she took that out of the hands of those concerned because she had a terrible program. And the 17-year-old Russian girl won. And then the Russian girl who then was vaulted into the silver. Well, let's just put it this way. It was bad for everybody. It was bad for that 
15-year-old Russian girl who's had drugs forced down her throat. Now, some might say that she is complicit, but I'm just, look, she's 15. All right? The coaches tell her what to do, what to eat, what to even watch on the television. Please. This 15-year-old girl collapsed psychologically for the whole world to see. And it had an impact upon all of those young women. And I might just say they're young girls. Because I don't know how many young women there are there. 17, still not a young woman. I'm sorry, you're still a girl. Okay. Is this the patriarchy speaking? Maybe, but I'm just saying. They're little kids still. Definitely at 15. Oh, I know people get married at 15, but they're still kids. And that was devastating to see. You know, I'm not a big fan of uh, the Russia uh, Olympic Committee. You know, even that, how that should not have been allowed. Russia is Russia. They don't need to, uh, uh, you know, get athletes from the former satellites of, Ru- of the Soviet Union. They don't need to draw off of that. It's Russia. Let just Russia compete. They don't have to be the Olympic Committee. The Russia Olympic Committee. Shut up. That should not have been allowed. But there is something very, very crooked going on still with the IOC. And that needs to be rooted out. And it needs to be rooted out by the roots. And I also think that Russia should be sanctioned. I'm also concerned, or not concerned necessarily, but I'm a little curious. That's it. I'm a little curious how the black sprinter who had smoked some pot in Oregon, where it is legal, was kicked off the team, could not get her medals in the uh, the Olympic trials. IOC said, nope. She had drugs in her system. And we might just say that the white Russian girl got to compete. Albeit with conditions, but she still got to compete. I think, and we all more than suspect, we know that something is rotten in Denmark. I know that's not where the IOC sits, but I like the term. And I suppose one might argue that with all the other trials and tribulations and travails of the world currently, why would we be talking about the Olympics? Something as trivial. (laughs) Well, I also think it's quite emblematic of uh, the rest of what is going on in the whole world. Yeah, Putin pushing himself around in the Olympics. Pushing the ILC around. Now he's surrounded Ukraine. Pushing there. Yeah, I thought that guy was supposed to be uh, withdrawing forces, and it turns out that he wasn't. Of course... Of course, then also the Republicans are saying, Joe lied. Joe lied. Really? Did he? Or did you guys sabotage him as usual? Like with the pandemic. Yeah. (laughs) Joe promised. Joe promised that the, the pandemic, the whole virus would be done. It would be done. He promised. No one ever promised that. In fact, you better get used to the concept that this pandemic's going to go on for probably another 10 years. Get used to it. Jesus, punch up. Snowflake whiners. I don't want any of them in my uh in my uh, little uh bomb crater. Fox hole. They're not going to be in mine whining. God, that's the last person you want. But now we're stuck with them apparently, huh? We're supposed to I don't know, sit down to Thanksgiving dinner with them? It's going to be hard. It's not really that hard. Don't have to. 
the maggot in my family refuses to have much to do with the family. Well, he speaks with our sister. Occasionally. But everybody else is blocked. My grandkids are blocked. The nieces and nephews are blocked. Their kids are blocked. Nice family values that guy's got there, huh? Can uh, make and pass judgments on everybody else about their value systems. You know, the ones that consist of empathy, compassion, charity. I just don't like your politics. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Because I don't try to intimidate people with a gun. (laughs) Or being a bully. Oh, boy, where did we, how did we get there? I don't know. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Oh! And then also, I guess they're going to have to recall a bunch of baptisms in Arizona. Well, we spoke about that yesterday anyway. But still, it, it's it, it, it's a great uh, another example that is emblematic of how the whole world is stuck in purgatory at least. Sorry, uh, you can't go to heaven. You're stuck here in purgatory because the priest used we instead of I. The royal we means I. I mean, the Holy See can get around that just by, uh, you know, making that proclamation. Everybody knows when the royal we is used, it means I. Because we, we, the entity of government, is I, the government. Anybody who uses the royal we means that, and that's why you want to avoid the royal we. We, we, we. Well, what are you going to do about it? I suppose we could be concerned. <laughs> I don't know. What about our animals when they're baptized? Were they baptized with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit? Only one counts. Okay. Well, and and I got to tell you, I I'm not making fun of this because of I don't know being prejudiced. One might say postjudiced is how I like to put it, because I I did attend seminary school, albeit ever so briefly, but I was a rather devout Catholic growing up, to the point I was an altar boy and served all those masses in the mornings every day. Jeez, tap your heart three times. Um, so yeah, and at some point, well, this is the thing about a Catholic education. They actually, uh, uh, teach you how to be a critical thinker. Sometimes you turn that critical thinking upon the belief system that uh, is teaching you. And that's actually somewhat encouraged. Is it a matter of, and a test of faith? Maybe. But, uh, when one realizes how much politics is involved, in organized religion is usually puts a sour taste in the mouth of meditative practice, contemplative uh, being the quiet. And uh, yeah, so but then on the other hand, you got a bunch of heretics making up religion as they go along. Yeah, Jesus would have killed you. <laughs> really? I thought he was the prince of peace and love. No, that's a commie uh, fake news. All right. That's where we are. And where should we be? I'll tell you where we should be is is explaining and and running down the uh, the curated part of the show. Oh, my God. Look at the time. Well, why don't we go ahead and do that? And at at the top, that was Lawrence uh, breaking down how no one testifies against Trump better than Trump. Guy just cannot shut his mouth. What an ego. (laughs) On the rest of the menu, West Virginia's only black female lawmaker has filed a lawsuit against an anti-abortion group over racist threats. The Biden administration granted loan relief to students misled by for-profit DeVry University and a Kushner pal at the Observer, pardoned by Trump, will plead guilty to state cyber-stalking charges in New York. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where a job advertisement for 30 women train drivers in Saudi Arabia got 28,000 applicants. 
and the leading standard German dictionary changed the definition of Jew after an outcry from the nation's Jewish community. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netflixradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. If you would look across from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, across to the left is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it would help tremendously. You know, Charlie Kirk and his ilk, the Talking Point USA people, you know, they get they they are on their way to having a billion dollar media empire because fascists get the money. And those of us who are fighting fascism obviously don't. I mean, where is George Soros? Where is he? They keep saying that he's funding all of this. I'd like to find out where. <laughs> anyway, instead of getting the Soros money or waiting for it, we, we have to make appeals to folks like you. And if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, and if you could afford to send those funds to us once a month, I can't tell you how much it helps. Because though we be uh, not a multi-billion dollar media empire, we be mighty. That's right. This powerhouse of resistance has been resisting for almost 11 years now because of the generosity of folks like you. And thank you for allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended. And once again, if you could afford an espresso type coffee drink, send those funds to us once a month. It really will help because it helps us fly under the radar and continue resisting. And don't we need to? <laughs> yes. Punch the Nazis. Don't negotiate with them. OK, thank you for your generosity and uh, thank you for generosity in the future. Hopefully the near future. All right. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. Show notes and links. The show notes and the links <laughs> take you to where the real reportage is. All right because it is important, because that's where it is. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, or really wherever podcasts can be found. And, of course, do remember that the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library is at the Internet Archive at archive.org. And we'll have uh, the links for that, well, we do have links for shows of our own, our particular shows, and the general link to the library uh, in our personal show notes as we do our shows. But we'll get it up on the ho at our Netroots Radio homepage at netrootsradio.com when we update that page, and that should be real soon. Okay, it's Thursday. Let's delve into this first uh, offering here that we've curated here for the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it is out of the Associated Press by John Robbie. West Virginia's only black female lawmaker has filed a lawsuit against an anti-abortion group citing a racist Facebook post and a racist email she received for supporting legislation that re would remove all restrictions on abortion. Delegate Danielle Walker, or yeah, Danielle Walker, filed the lawsuit on Tuesday in Kanawha County Circuit Court against West Virginians for Life and Richard Damoski, 
who resigned as president of the group's Berkeley County chapter after he admitted posting the image of a KKK man, a Ku Klux Klansman, on the group's Facebook page. The post targeted Walker by name. She said she remains in fear for her life and wears protective safety gear. The lawsuit alleges that the email and Facebook posts were authored and posted by West Virginians for Life and constitute the modern-day digital equivalent of burning a cross in Delegate Walker's front yard. You know, we had a few of those burned on our, in our lawn in our front yard when I was growing up. But when you were a kid, I guess you don't realize the whole... Uh, importance of what that meant. <laughs> Boy, do I now. Walker, a Mononongalia, excuse me, I'm not from there, county Demogra Democrat, is co-sponsoring the legislation to repeal all abortion restrictions in West Virginia. A mother, she has spoken publicly about having an abortion in the past. These digital communications were and are designed by West Virginians for life to harass, intimidate, and strike me with fear of violence if I continue my support of a woman's right to choose, Walker said in a statement. West Virginians for Life did not immediately respond to a telephone message seeking comment on the lawsuit. Damoski resigned earlier this month from the chapter after admitting his action violated the group's bylaws. He did not have a listed telephone number and did not immediately respond to a Facebook message from the AP. The lawsuit seeks unspecified damages through a jury trial and asks for a restraining order to prohibit the defendants from further contact with Walker. In contrast to Walker's proposed measure, the Republican-led West Virginia House of Delegates passed a bill on Tuesday that would ban abortion after 15 weeks. A piece of legislation almost identical to the Mississippi law, currently under review by the U.S. Supreme Court. The legislation will now move on to the state Senate, which is also dominated by Republicans. Colin Binkley of Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. The Biden administration yesterday, Wednesday, announced it will cancel more than $70 million in student debt for borrowers who say they were defrauded by the for-profit DeVry University. The first time the Education Department has approved such claims for an institution that is still in operation. At least 1,800 former DeVry students will get their loans cleared after the department concluded that the school lied about the su success of its graduates in order to get new students to enroll. The agency said it plans to force the school to cover the cost of the $71.7 million in loan discharges. The action was part of a broader installment of $415 million in loan relief from students of for-profit colleges. Students count on their colleges to be truthful, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said in a statement, unfortunately... Today's findings show too many instances in which students were misled into loans at institutions or programs that could not deliver what they'd promised. DeVry spokesperson Donna Schultz said the allegations predate the school's current board and leadership. The company was sold in 2018, while the Biden administration's allegations include a period that ends in 2015. Along with the DeVry action, the Education Department also moved to forgive $344 million in loans from former students at ITT Tech, Westwood College, Corinthian Colleges, and other defunct 
for-profit college. Michael R. Sisek of the AP brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A former newspaper editor who received a pardon from Trump pleaded guilty yesterday, Wednesday, to state cyberstalking charges in New York in a deal that could eventually see the case dropped. Manhattan prosecutors said they will withdraw Ken Kirsten's misdemeanor counts of attempted computer trespass and attempted eavesdropping in a year if he performs 100 hours of community service and stays out of trouble. Kirsten, a friend of Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was charged in August with hacking his wife's online accounts and sending threatening, harassing messages to several people amid he did divorce proceedings in 2015. Kirsten, the editor of the New York Observer when it was owned by Kushner, sometimes monitored his now ex-wife's computer activity from his desk at the newspaper's Manhattan offices, prosecutors said. The state case mirrored a federal case against Kirsten that went away when Trump pardoned him in January of 2021 in the final hours of his White House term. Presidential pardons apply only to federal crimes, not state offenses. Assistant District Attorney Alona Katz said in court that Kirsten has gone more than six years without reoffending and has taken steps to prevent such behavior. As part of Kirsten's plea deal, prosecutors reduced his original felony charges of eavesdropping and computer trespass to misdemeanor attempt charges. If he meets the other terms, prosecutors will exchange those charges for harassment, a low-level offense that is characterized as a violation, not a crime, under state law. A check-in hearing is scheduled for May 18th. Kirsten of South Orange, New Jersey, was the first person in Trump's orbit charged by local prosecutors after being pardoned by the former president. It was not the first time Manhattan prosecutors have tangled with Trump or one of his allies. Last year, the DA's year-long criminal investigation into Trump and his business practices led to tax fraud charges against his company, the Trump Organization, and his longtime chief financial officer, Alan Weiselberg, both have pleaded not guilty. In Kirsten's case, double jeopardy was not an issue because his federal case ended before a conviction or acquittal. That's what pardons do, apparently. The federal case against Kirsten, who now works in the cryptocurrency industry, of course, arose from a background check. When Trump offered Kirsten a seat in 2018 on the board of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Manhattan prosecutors started investigating Kirsten for possible violations of state law once Trump pardoned him. In explaining the pardon, the Trump White House cited a letter from Kirsten's ex-wife in which she said she never wanted him investigated or arrested and repeatedly asked the FBI to drop it. According to Manhattan prosecutors, Kirsten monitored her computer keystrokes in 2015 and 2016 using spyware, obtaining passwords and accessing her Gmail and Facebook accounts. In October of 2015, prosecutors said he accessed and then anonymously disseminated her Facebook messages. And according to a criminal complaint, she told police in his New Jersey town 
that he was terrorizing her through email and social media, causing problems for her at work and in her social life. Indeed. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook of Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Emily Schwing. Have you ever looked up to see a hawk soar overhead? or a small chickadee flit by and wondered, how do they do that? Believe it or not, scientists never really knew either, until now. I looked at the relationship between form and function in the most basic sense. Talia Lowy mary is a PhD student at the University of Toronto in Canada. She says bird flight has everything to do with the shape and size of a bird's sternum, or breastbone. Bird sternums have a projection from the middle called the keel. And this is where the flight muscles are attached. It's plausible to think that this element is important for flight. But why does it vary so much in shape and size relative to the body? There are all these questions about it that haven't been answered in the past. So Mary set out to find some answers using a database of CT scanned sternums from 105 different bird species, like the red-capped lark, leeches storm petrel, and the southern cassowary. She also included two extinct birds, the dodo and the great auk. The scans combine a series of x-rays to create three-dimensional images. And so because the sternum is a complex element in three dimensions, it's not just a 2D bone, it's got projections out the middle and out the sides. Um, looking at it in three dimensions is uh, the best way to quantify the shape and analyze it in a statistical framework. So uh, more recently, those methods have become more accessible. Um, and I guess because of that, I was able to do it now and maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't possible. Mary and colleagues used the scans to create computerized 3D models. And so when you do that, you can move it around, you can place points on it in the important spots. And so that's what I was doing. I was putting uh, these dots that are called landmarks. And the landmarks uh, basically quantify in 3D computer space uh, where the important points are on the element. The findings published in BMC Biology show that sternum size and shape has a direct impact on the way a bird flies. So an eagle uh, would be soaring and wouldn't be moving its wings as much. It just has its arms stretched out. It has very intricate structures in its wings and in its um, shoulder uh, to hold the wings out. But it doesn't have to use as much flapping power. But compare the majestic eagle with a frantically flapping duck. Birds with a deep sternal keel fly more slowly. Those with long sternums are associated with running birds. Mary also looked at foot-propelled underwater diving birds. These are species like the cormorant, the loon, and the grebe. They have this streamlined sternum with a lower sternal keel, so everything is kind of compact and flattened. Um, But you actually see something really similar in birds that are wing-propelled divers. Those wing-propelled divers include small birds you might find on the ocean, puffins, common murres, and penguins. (laughs) Mary says whether wing or foot-propelled, the sternums of these birds are similar in shape. All other sorts of factors are possibly, most likely, contributing to the shape of the sternum, not just locomotion. Things like birds that dance 
to attract a mate or how big their egg is relative to their body size. There are all sorts of things that could be contributing to this. We've just, you know, scratched the surface, looked at one aspect of variation, but there's so much more. Mary believes that the shape and structure of the sternum impacts how different species of birds breathe. She also says different methods of flight mean different resource demands for individual species. Diving deep into how birds fly today can tell scientists a lot about how they evolved over millions of years. So birds evolved from dinosaurs, and we don't know exactly which fossil birds and which dinosaurs were capable of flight, but Gaining a better understanding of how birds fly today is the key to completing that picture of how the dinosaurs were moving through the world. Mary plans to dig into fossil birds next, in part to learn more about the origins of flight. The thing about fossil birds is that a lot of them are flattened into rock slabs, but there are so many amazing bird fossils, especially from China. And so they will have to be studied a little bit differently because I may not be able to put them in a three-dimensional context as I did with the modern bird, Sterna. For now, though, she says she's looking differently at the small passerine birds that flit by her windows and dominate the tree branches in her backyard in Ontario. They're mostly continuous flapping birds. They're flapping pretty quickly. They're moving from branch to branch. You know, they're trying to keep away from predators and get some food, whether it's insects or berries. Yeah, it made me think about how, you know, their skeletons are structured and also how their muscles are working much differently than, let's say, a hawk that's soaring above. And so they would require different metabolism and different food sources and how they use that in their body would be very different. For 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwing. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good eating habits developed in childhood can last a lifetime, but getting children to eat their fruits and vegetables is a common problem. Eating them adds important nutrients, helps control weight, and reduces the risks for many serious illnesses. Children in the U.S. are eating more fruit. However, 60% of children get fewer fruits than recommended, and 93% don't get enough vegetables. Child care, schools, and school districts can help change this by meeting or exceeding federal nutrition standards for meals and snacks, including fruits and vegetables wherever food is offered, and helping children learn about and taste fruits and vegetables. At home, parents can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables with their children and provide them as snacks, even if it takes many tries. Also, parents can include their children when shopping for growing, and preparing fruits and vegetables. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. At the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, the framers of the Constitution reached a compromise that called for proportional representation based on population in the House of Representatives. This meant that the larger the state's population was, the more representatives it would have in Congress. But there was a problem. The southern states wanted enslaved African Americans counted for purposes of representation. Northerners countered that if enslaved people were counted for purposes of representation, 
Those representatives would simply serve the slaveholders' interests, not the interests of the enslaved people. In the end, the delegates reached a compromise. The entire population of the United States would be counted every 10 years. They would count enslaved people for purposes of representation, but only three-fifths, hence the name Three-Fifths Compromise. This was found in Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, but was later removed by the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868. This has been 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. 60 Second Civics is a podcast of the Center for Civic Education. My name is Mark Gage. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. A current question is which workers are entitled to union representation? Who really gets counted as a worker? And who decides wages, hours, and conditions? These were the questions that divided the campus of Yale University. On this day in labor history, the year was 1992. The Graduate Employee Student Organization on campus began a three-day strike. They were supported by Locals 34 and 35, part of the Hotel and Restaurant Employees International Union, who represented the clerical workers, dining service staff and technical and maintenance workers at Yale University, as well as the dietary workers at Yale New Haven Hospital. These workers stood in solidarity with the graduate employees and walked out in a show of support. They recognized the important work the graduate employees did for the university, including teaching classes and grading papers. Yet, Yale administrators argued the graduate employees' primary role was that of the student and they were therefore not entitled to union representation. The year before, the graduate students had held a one-day strike, but did not gain union recognition. As a result of the 1992 strike, some graduate students received improved funding. They also received inclusion on the Yale Executive Committee, an administrative body. Yet, they were again denied the right to be in a union. Another strike three years later had the same result. Today, there are 31 recognized graduate student unions in the United States. There are 18 that remain unrecognized. One of these is at Yale University. Today, universities more and more seek to cut costs by having graduate students and adjuncts teach courses. These workers are paid far less than tenured professors, and they are increasingly turning to the idea of unionization. The question remains, will they be recognized as real workers, and will they have a say in their wages, hours, and conditions? Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 30 degrees Fahrenheit under foggy conditions. Cloudy skies a little later on this morning will then become partly cloudy in the afternoon. Highs around 60 with winds light and variable, partly cloudy tonight, lows in the low 30s, winds remaining light and variable, and also light and variable tomorrow with plenty of sun, highs in the mid 60s. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County continue to rise. We now stand at 411, I'm sorry. 411,045 confirmed cases and our deceased have increased as well. And we now stand at 451. Pollen is rated at none. Right outside the window here in Rogue River proper, the air quality index for the region is good at 21 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is in the moderate range at level three. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30. 5 inches. Visibility is down to a half mile and relative humidity is at 96%. 
Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 52 degrees and fair. Paris is 57 and partly cloudy. Rome is 58 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 42 with light rain. Kabul is 32 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 57 and cloudy. Tokyo is 36 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 72 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 53 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 61 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A job advert to recruit 30 female train drivers in Saudi Arabia has attracted 28,000 applicants, highlighting the scale of pent-up demand as the conservative kingdom up, opens up more opportunities to women. Spanish railway operator Renfe said on Wednesday yesterday an online assessment of academic background and English language skills had helped it to reduce the number of candidates by around half and it would work through the rest by mid-March. The 30 selected women will drive bullet trains between the cities of Mecca and Medina after a year of paid training. Renfe, which said it was keen to create opportunities for women in its local business, currently employs 80 men to drive its trains in Saudi Arabia and has 50 more under instruction. Job opportunities for Saudi women have until recently been limited to roles such as teachers and medical workers as they had to observe strict gender segregation rules. Women were not even allowed to drive in the kingdom until 2018. Female participation in the workforce has nearly doubled in the, in the last five years to 33% amid a drive by the Saudi crown prince to open up the kingdom and diversify the economy. And women are now taking up jobs once restricted to men and migrant workers. Saudi Arabia is highlighting progress on gender issues at a time of scrutiny in the West over its human rights record, including a crackdown on dissent that ensnared dozens of women's rights activists and the 2018 murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Kristen Grishaba of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The leading dictionary of standard German has changed its definition of Jew or Jude in German after a recent update caused an uproar in the country's Jewish community. The Duden Dictionary had recently added an explanation to its online edition saying that occasionally the term Jew is perceived as discriminatory because of the memory of the National Socialist use of the language. In these cases, formulations such as Jewish people, Jewish fellow citizens, or people of the Jewish faith 
are usually chosen. This explanation led to an outcry from leading Jewish groups and individuals who stressed that identifying themselves as being called Jews is not discriminatory, in contrast to what Duden's definition said. The publisher of Duden reacted to the criticism and updated its definition again on Monday to reflect the Jewish community's input. Well, that's a good thing. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver